Okay, I think <coughs> a little bit of water. So the last um, question on the slide was a perfect transition. How do humans tackle such situations and others? So I'm concerned about human movements, how humans tackle situations such as intermittent and continuous control. Interaction with objects. So hang in there. Last talk before lunch. Um, let me set the stage. How do humans interact with complex ob objects in intermittent and continuous way? With an example which is probably one of the pinnacles of how humans interact with objects, a gymnast who is in full control of her body, but not only her body, but also her body with respect to a whole number of different objects, such as the hoop and the ribbon, which we already saw <coughs> in Neville Hogan's talk. Important also in her actions is that her end effectors change flexibly, which is part of the art and the skill that she shows. So I would hold that this is probably the pinnacle of skill. So life is full of such skills, right? From eating spaghetti, I'm sorry, from eating spaghetti to skateboarding to playing ball of sorts and carrying a cup of coffee. And maybe also to uh, just keep in mind that when we look at athletic activities, leisure time activities, a lot of those inv uh, involve objects that have some complex dynamics that challenge the body. So interacting with challenging objects is sort of not only fact of life, but something that humans seek. So interactive skills. What I want to do here in this talk is to pick three of those skills and go through it and, sh and find out how humans deal with this. What are the principles that humans employ to achieve skill and ultimately, in singular cases, skill as the one we saw with the gymnast. So I want to start with a very simple action interaction, and that is throwing a ball to a target meaning we have an object, a simple object, a ball, that we release in a targeted manner in order to hit a target accurately. The next step up towards interaction is looking at bouncing a ball, where we hold a racket and bounce a ball in a rhythmic fashion to a target height, meaning we control, again, a relatively simple object in an intermittent fashion. But now we already have a dynamical system because the one interaction, the one collision determines the height and thereby the next collision. The last example I want to talk through is, well, carrying a cup of coffee or maybe a glass of wine, where the object now has internal dynamics, infinite number of degrees of freedom, the liquid. And we constantly, when we act against or with, with the object, we exert forces on the internal uh, degrees of freedom that then act back on us. And we continuously need to adjust how we handle that object so that we don't spill the coffee. What is skill? So let's look at some definitions that come from human movement science. And one pretty ancient one goes as follows. Skill is the learned ability to bring about predetermined results with maximum certainty often with minimum outlay of time or energy or both. It's a bit of a horrible definition with all these options, but let's just look at the pieces that uh, are being addressed here. Well, maximum certainty, a certainty, a certainty and minimum of time is speed accuracy trade-off. Um, energy minimization or decreasing uncertainty or noise in the system, right? And let me preamble here. One of the main recognitions, understanding of the human system, one of the seeming disadvantages, seeming disadvantages of the human system is that we have a lot of variability and intrinsic noise. So <clears throat> what is part of that definition is that we want to achieve maximum certainty 
with a system that has noise. And so one way of going about is, well, let's decrease that uncertainty or noise inside. Or maybe, as I like to say, skill might be conceived of a little bit differently, namely that these are the solutions or the strategies that make this intrinsic neuromotor noise matter less. We can't eliminate it, so let's find skillful ways to deal with it and still achieve the task that we want to achieve. Now, I said interactive skills, physical interactions, actually poses more and interesting problems where we can see how that first definition is achieved. So, just to kind of characterize the range of physical interactions that imply solutions that negotiate constraints, where we switch between continuous intermittent control, we exploit forces and resonances, we have to predict object dynamics. How does all of that come together for us now as a noisy system where I want to show you that we find strategies that make noise matter less? Where shall we start? So this is a very schematic, simplified loop from brain to muscle contractions with information processing. So shall we start with the brain and then try and understand behavior? Well, in, your, in our context here, brain means controller. What kind of control might we have that then produces that desired behavior? And I would just want to refer to some other work you heard, uh, every, we all heard Neville Hogan's talk yesterday about dynamic primitives. This is something that I also share and we partly collaborate on this issue. But what I want to show you here today is the other side, namely let's Let's start with the behavior and then make deductions of what might go on in the controller, in the brain, but maybe not even with the behavior, but rather with the task. Let's begin with those tasks that I just described and analyze those tasks to then develop predictions or hypotheses about what behavior might look like in order to make noise matter less. So, the way we go about is to choose tasks, as I just uh, laid out, the three tasks, then model the tasks. Once we have a model, we can analyze it and derive the space of solutions that satisfy the goal of the task. Then, once we have the mathematical model, we render it in a virtual environment, which then becomes basically a video game a game, an interactive task for human subjects where we can measure uh, human, uh, measure and analyze human performance. We can apply interesting manipulations to probe the system, to test our hypothesis. And lastly, based on all this, we can also design interventions to modify behavior. Let me give you an example, and the first example is what we call Skittles, which is a table game where a ball is suspended like a pendulum from a pole, and the goal is to throw the ball around the pole to hit a Skittle, in our case one Skittle, on the other side of the pole. So we take this into our lab in the following way, that we model it in very simple, in a two-dimensional way, sort of in a top-down view, such that we have the ball centered here, suspended by two orthogonal springs, very simple model, and then when you deflect the ball, as in here, and you impart it with a certain velocity at a certain position, then the ball traverses an elliptic path that is meant to hit the target. If it doesn't, as in this case, there is an error, which is defined as the minimum distance between the trajectory and the center of the target. As you immediately see, the trajectory of the ball is fully determined by the angle and the, ang and the tangential velocity here. So there is two variables, position and velocity at the execution and the error that map into one error. So there is a very simple redundant task two to one redundancy. That nevertheless, here are just the equations behind of the ball trajectory that then have a solution manifold, a one dimensional manifold, which are all those, contain all those um, 
position velocity samples that achieve zero error. Graphically, oh no, first, this is then our virtual implementation where we have our subject <coughs> perform a throwing task, a little bit like Frisbee. You have your arm resting on a manipulandum, which has a potentiometer or encoder that measures the angular rotations of the arm. And we have a wooden ball attached to that manipulandum, which has a little force sensor, such that when you move your arm and you release your finger, then the force sensor senses the release of the ball that is then those, condition, those position velocity sample is used to calculate the ball trajectory on the virtual display. So here is what the subject see. This is the online display of the forearm rotations and the release of the ball, and it can go to the right or the left. We leave all options open, partly in order for the subject to see that there is redundancy in the execution. Red is when the error is below a certain th threshold. So here is just a, a nice graphical way of analyzing this redundancy because we have a two-to-one mapping, so we can very nicely graphically show this, which in the neuroscience is a good thing because they're not quite as um, theoretically trained as this audience is. So here we have release angle and release velocity, and coded by color is the error. This nonlinear one-dimensional one manifold is the one that achieves zero error, and increasing darker color denotes increasing error. So these three points are three throws which exactly map on those three examples here where the green and the red with very different release angles lead to a zero error here. The trajectory goes right through the target and the blue trajectory is the one with a non-zero error. Already look a little bit at the, um, the layout of this error surface here. You can see that here, the curvature of the surface is much higher than in this neighborhood. So as simple as the Skittles game is, it has a nonlinear solution manifold with a very different neighborhood at different places. So that then is the basis for us to start to rationalize how should subjects actually learn and execute uh, that task in order to ultimately have the best performance, zero error. So let's take a look at a sample, at a sketch data set here, where you see that same manifold. And here is a sketch data set which sometimes begins far off where we might want to be. So how can we now analyze how subjects improve with practice? Well, in this case, there are three different ways to achieve better performance. The one is translating your variability, scaling such that on average, the errors become better, and lastly, uh, I, I said rotating, I'm sorry, rotating and scaling the variability to get better. So. These three operations are three distinct ways how a variable system can actually exploit what the task, which has redundancy, offers. So let's take a look at actual subject data just by example. See here a subject on day one. You see the data scattered pretty much all over the place, but after another five days of practice, you see how they start to cluster in this right arm of the manifold and already aligned or co-varying with the manifold. And on the last day, 15, you see how the data also started to cluster more tightly, i.e. scaled. So we have a way of quantifying these three different components towards task improvement. And we have shown that indeed subjects use all three, that is translation towards a more error tolerant area, then rotation to align with a manifold and decreasing of the dispersion to ultimately even get even better, even though that last element is the toughest one for humans, as I said, we have intrinsic variability or noise that we have to deal with. So the lessons, oh, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. 
The lessons that we learned from this work is that humans have noise, they're sensitive to error tolerance solutions, and then they channel their variability in directions that does not affect the task outcome. One more interesting way of analyzing performance here is the following. As you might have noticed, angle and velocity is also state space of the arm movement. So we can also plot the arm trajectory against this way of uh, <coughs> this solution space. So here are two trajectories, two arm trajectories. And I think it becomes qu it's quite clear that, well, one is better than the other. Which one is probably better? Well, this blue trajectory has two intersections with this zero error manifold. So there are two time moments where zero error can be achieved. Whereas the green trajectory that aligns with the manifold actually then has a window, or maybe picking up the term from the previous speaker, time redundancy. There is a window that within which you can allow yourself slack and still release the ball with zero error. And this latter one, we have also analyzed, again, the same subject. You see the trajectories here rather scattered, and there are the points of release. After day six, the trajectory has changed, and the points are close to the manifold here, but not yet aligned due to um, the increasing alignment of the trajectory on day 15. They have this covariation of releases due to the alignment of the arm trajectory with the manifold. We quantified this um, and could indeed show that over 15 days of practice, this timing window successively increases, while the actual timing error, which would be the time difference between the actual release and the intersection with the manifold, very quickly asymptotes. So, skill is solutions that make intrinsic noise matter less. Two ways that I tried to give evidence to this statement. Now, two additional remarks why this task is actually very interesting to worry about human movements. So, ever so simple, right, the task. However, as you might immediately intuit, when I place the target at different locations, the shape of the manifold or geometry of the manifold changes. This is one location and the manifold looks like this. This is another location and it looks like that. So then this opens up a whole bunch of interesting ideas how we generalize once we learn one target to another one, how we potentially learn the, the topology of the manifold behind different instantiations of the task. One other comment, different comment, and this is a bit more problematic, and that is what I've shown you is using angle and velocity measured in this polar coordinate system, which produces manifolds like this. But what about if I use or quantify the very same release, but now in terms of, well, Cartesian coordinates, let's say, the two components of velocity. Then if I have this type of um, mapping, the manifold actually changes. So this is a little bit, this, we're, we're thinking about this, how to then take the findings that we have had and uh, published so far about these changes of variability and how it aligns with the manifold, how that formulation can, can become invariant across different coordinates. This is not yet solved, not trivial. This is something that I have worked with Neville Hogan about. Moving on, bouncing a ball. Now, under the same intrinsic noise matters less, I've, ad I've taken a different account. So as I was saying before, bouncing a ball rhythmically is a dynamical system. A dynamical system has stability. So let's see how that idea translates into the human performance context and what we can learn from this. So as I did before, I go through 
mathematically modeling the task, analyze solutions, take it into a virtual environment, analyze human behavior. So first, modeling the task. We did that in an extremely simplistic way, assuming a planar surface, instantaneous impact of the ball, ballistic flight, energy loss, uh, in quantified in the coefficient of restitution, and then ballistic flight and gravity. Here we formulated that model in terms of using a Poincaré section such that we can look then at the fixed point and the stability of the fixed point. So the analysis is in spirit the same, I think, as, as is embodied in the passive dynamic walker. We're looking for those bouncing solutions that have stability. And why? Because our hypothesis now becomes that humans seek these stable solutions because small errors die out by themselves, because their intrinsic noise does not, that may introduce perturbations, does not need continuous error corrections. We can uh, rely on the self-correcting properties of the dynamical system. How can we test that? Local linear stability analysis showed us that the contact needs to be such that the acceleration of the racket approximated here as a sinusoid, the contact of the racket and the ball needs to be at a phase where the racket is negatively decelerating, decelerating in its upward motion. And this is an easy prediction. It actually has bounds, upper bounded by zero, lower bounded by a term that's uh, quantified by gravity and um, the coefficient of restitution, which tends to be between zero and minus nine meters squared. So we can easily do that. We measure our subjects again, as I said, in a virtual environment where we give the subjects a ping pong paddle that is attached to a vertical rod where the linear the displacements are measured by an encoder. And we also have an accelerometer at the paddle. And then in addition, we have a little solenoid that applies a brake to the upward motion such that the contact of the ball and the racket in the virtual environment is felt, so to have a more realistic um, experience. So here is, again, the minimalistic environment that subject C it's minimalistic because this is the, the exact rendering of the model. There is nothing that we don't understand analytically. So, so how do humans seek dynamic stability and how robust is this stability if the actor has to change behavior and explore new solutions? This is the question of one experiment where we had subjects in a first part perform 48 trials, one trial is 60 seconds bouncing. And then in part two, they did the same 48 trials again after 10 normal trials where we applied a perturbation, which I'll explain in a moment. So let's first look at this regular behavior and let's look at this rapid acceleration, which is predicted to be negative in order to ensure stability of that toy bouncing system. And or let's begin with the error, and the error is the ball difference, uh, the ball amplitude and the difference to the target amplitude. The error goes down with practice, as all learning experiments typically show. But here the interesting additional finding is that our predicted racket acceleration also goes down with a relatively similar time scale as the error, and interestingly, Subjects do begin with positive acceleration, and it takes them about, say, 12 trials to find out that this negative acceleration is apparently the better way to perform. And we take this as evidence that they found this dynamically stable solution where they don't have to correct at every bounce. So importantly, as I said, humans find these seemingly non-intuitive smart solutions, non-intuitive because in the beginning they don't know those solutions. This solution is insensitive to noise and avoids act active uh, error correction, and humans do exploit this. Now let's move on to part two, and 
without telling you the perturbation, I'll say 10 trials in the beginning, they have very good performance in terms of error, then this constant perturbation is applied and the error shoots up, then they learn and they settle back to this equally good performance. The acceleration, similarly, it begins at minus 3 meters per second square as before from part 1. The perturbation offsets them and then they gradually go back to this stable solution. So what kind of perturbation did we apply here? Well, let's take a quick, slightly different look at the same task and let's take a look which only focuses on a single bounce and then actually on a single bounce we can do that same say, mechanical analysis that reveals redundancy in every single bounce such that the height error here is determined by the downcoming ball velocity, the racket velocity, and the impact position. That is, we have three variables that map into one error. So just as with the Skittles analysis, now we have a three-dimensional execution space with a two-dimensional um, solution manifold and we can plot each contact, each ball contact, as one point in that space. This ellipsoid is just the fit of a whole data cloud of 60 to 80 points in a single trial. So what we then did as a perturbation is after they learned their preferred behavior, we actually penalized this area which describes their, call it, ball of performance, such that we we increased the ball amplitude to basically signal to them they cannot control the ball here. And then we looked how do they change their behavior. So here again, by example, one subject that begins, say, with this um, performance, which is then penalized. And at the end of this 48 trials, this last trial is has moved on the manifold, in this case here, to the right to different impact position and racket velocities. So they have, uh, they stayed on the manifold, but interestingly also, they moved away far enough such that, that their ball of own variability does not overlap with the penalized area. So not only do they avoid it, but they avoid that old solution sufficiently much to not have their own variability uh, overlap with a pe uh, penalized area. Okay, so again, a task where I try to, uh, to provide some evidence that the subjects find solutions where their intrinsic noise matters less, and in particular here, focusing on the physical interactions, I have shown that dynamic stability is one means by which to arrive at this solution. Let me move on to the last task, which is, in fact, mechanically speaking, the most complex task, namely continuously interacting with this complex dynamic object, which has water inside. Let's see whether I can do it. And as before, we go into the very, very simplistic case where we can handle the mechanics, at least where I can handle the mechanics. And that is, we model this cup of coffee basically with a cart and pendulum problem, with a cart and pendulum um, model, such that this is the cup, this is the water, but what we show on the virtual, in the virtual implementation, we only show the bob of the ball and the arc that it traverses, as you can faintly see here on the screen. And subjects interact with this object via a robotic manipulandum where they not only can move the cart or the cup, but they also, we program, they can experience the forces that act against the hand. So to give you a quick impression, this is one of the many kind of tasks that we can then implement. And here you see the subject moving this cup left and right. And in fact, there were no amplitude specifications. It's very hard to see. There were large target areas here where they had to move back and forth according to a metronome that was pacing them at one hertz. So how do we now deal with this object? How can we use our knowledge of the task
to analyze the task and predict certain behaviors. So the way we began here is the task was to move at a given frequency sinusoidally back and forth, all right? So we simulated, we used inverse dynamics in order to bring about cup sinusoidal motion and then inversely calcula or calculated the force that is required in order to bring about this sinusoidal cup oscillation. And this is the ball oscillations or the ball fluctuations. So as you can see in this example where we initialized the ball angle at a certain um, value, the required input force can become very complex. Interestingly here, it's another example where we did the inverse kinematics with a different initial ball angle. And here the input is relatively easy with two or three frequency components. In fact, doing this analysis was uh, revealed an interesting feature, namely chaos in the system. And to quickly explain how we get to this diagram is we strobed the input force at the maximum cup displacements and obtained the, uh, the relevant in, um, force and then projected this and looked at the marginal distribution. And the marginal distribution is what we plot here for the given initial ball angle. So this is corresponds to this simulated time series and this point corresponds to this simulated time series. Well, Based on that, or let me, uh, we did the following. Let me go back to this here. So intuitively and obviously, this doesn't appear to be a good solution because there is a lot of stuff going on, a lot of forces and irregularities, a lot of unpredictable irregularities um, in the input force. So how do we characterize this solution versus this solution? What we did was to take the cup, um, the input force and the cup dynamics and in a second simulation also the ball dynamics and we took the correlation or mutual information between those two time series as a way to quantify the complexity of the interaction and ultimately the, the predictability of this interaction. Then we summarized all these simulations in this plot where on the x-axis is the initial ball angle. And here we have amplitude, that is the amplitude of the cup position because that also was varied and unspecified in the experiment. This whole diagram is for one hertz oscillations because that's what we did in the experiment. Now the color corresponds to mutual information where the light areas are high mutual information, meaning predictable solutions versus the low mutual information where there was unpredictable solutions. So again, the light is not great, but let me point out that this is very chaotic here in having some islands of high mutual information and others not. But there is a large area <coughs> on this side with light color, i.e. high mutual information. So on average, we predict that our subject should aim to perform with these initial ball angles and cup amplitudes. Before we evaluate the data, we also look at alternative hypotheses that are us usually banded around, and one of it is minimizing force. So what we did here was for the same inverse dynamic simulations, we integrated the squared force, and we would predict, that's, and this hypothesis would predict, that subjects minimize force, which corresponds to a minimum down here with a minimum amplitude at a certain initial position. Lastly, we did the same inverse dynamics and we calculated the smoothness of the cup and the ball dynamics in order to test whether smoothness is optimized. And we get a similar layout here where actually there is sort of a lot of, let's say, r relatively local minima, but the global minimum is right up here. So now we have this space with three different predictions where subjects should end up here 
if they maximize mutual information here, if they minimize force, and up here if they uh, maximize smoothness. So here are the data. The data here for each trial, one point and lots of subjects, you see that they are scattered all around and then with practice they start to cluster in exactly that area here. This is really bad in color, right? So let's leave it like this. So we saw no sign that they minimized force and no sign that they maximized smoothness. It was the relation between the object dynamics and the input force that mattered for them, and they tried to simplify this dynamics. Am I ready? That's good. So, did not minimize, but they sought what I now interpret as predictable solutions. Those where the relation between the input force and the object dynamics was maximally uh, predictable. Ah, so then I can just, uh, again, here, is, here are eight subjects and we show the initial trial and the end trial. And for each subject, they, they started at various places, but they all ended up in this area. I just wanted to show with this subject individual presentation that for each subject they converged into this same area. Okay, so predictability as another notion that matters in how humans organize their movements. And very loosely I sort of uh, wanted to say, I think that meshes with uh, Friston's um, idea of uh, minimizing surprise. Okay, last, last point. Predictability and stability in discrete movements. What I just showed you was a, an analysis that we developed in those rhythmic movements. But what about just taking the cup from here to there? How can we possibly analyze what is going on in order to achieve safe and stable, robust trajectories. So what we did here was, again, we had the start box and the target box and subjects move the cup from here to there as fast as possible. And there's a little, call it a speed bump that they saw there was a perturbation and they had to navigate that cup through that perturbation that was either assistive or resistive uh, under the additional constraint as fast as possible. So the experimental design was, well, after first practice, we, uh, they went through assistive uh, perturbation trials and then resistive perturbation trials. And the hypothesis was that trajectories become stable in preparation for resistive perturbations and may be unstable for the assistive ones, meaning you don't want to spill the coffee, you want to prepare yourself that you're not getting thrown off. So you want to be stable to face this perturbation. And in the other case where you basically get pushed, you might want to just exploit that ride towards the end. So we formulated in stable, unstable, and tried to extract or analyze this um, notion of stability in trajectories. Here are just some sample trials. This is the first, this is over cup position. We show cup velocity in the beginning as it is here, perturbed with these assistive perturbations and here perturbed in the opposite direction with the resistive perturbation. And now I just have no results yet, only I wanted to just present this analysis, this ongoing collaboration with Albert Mukot, um, Mukowski and Thierry Dijkstra and Martin Giese, who is, this is in preparation, so even the author list is not fully established. So what did we do? We tried to estimate local robustness to internal external noise using contraction analysis. So we can't do that fixed point stability analysis because we have a trajectory. And contraction analysis is, ha, has more relaxed conditions in that it can assess the stability of a trajectory. Now, how do you do that in human movements? 
And I think there we have a relatively nice and unique, uh, you've seen that in Martin Gies's work. So again, we exploit the fact that we have this virtual environment where we can measure human subjects' data and we have the exact mathematical knowledge of the task. So what we do is, well, we measure human data, we measure all the states needed for in the model, and then we take each sample at each time uh, point, we take those samples and we plug them into the equations of motion and then we can do contraction analysis on a model and not on the data. So we can analyze the contraction at every moment in time. And here is just one first way of presenting our results. And as I said, this is totally ongoing. I was just so excited because I thought you might like that and so I presented it. Um, here is um, the ball, just showing the ball dynamics or the projected ball dynamics. And here in gray shades are the contraction exponent or contraction rates that the system goes through. And we are about to analyze how the trajectory evolves after the perturbation and how it traverses through different regions of stability based on this analysis. Okay. Skill in physical interaction solutions exploit object dynamics to make interactions more predictable and stability, they exploit stability to make noise matter less. Just in summary, again, the approach that I'm taking is let's begin with analyzing the task rather than measuring and describing behavior because the task allows us then to make predictions and evaluate human performance. And just a little round back to what the future is to gain insight into what might matter for the controller and then link it to how the controller might employ dynamic primitives to actually execute this uh, type of performance. And that's my thank you slide. Thank you very much. Oh, hi. So, thanks, Dagmar. That's a really nice talk. Just a few comments. You know what they say, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So, if you go back to the slide where, where you had the chaos and the, the one on the right, yeah. you know what? There's a really interesting sparsity problem hidden there because the solution to a right actually is sparse. Uh -huh. I mean, if you do the Hankel on that one, it will pop up as sparse. And if you look at the mutual information between the input and the output, what actually you're enforcing in that plot, you're enforcing that the joint representation of both of them is sparse. Okay. So okay. if you go back to your, can you go back to your last slide? The, 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 the very last one, that, that one. So I'm willing to add two things. First of all, when you go and trying to solve the inverse problem, the brain control, you have multiple solutions. I'm willing to bet that the sparsest one, even if you do L1 regularization, will be the right one. And the dynamic primitives, the right task, the brain is actually going to pick the sparsest solution in terms of your dynamic primitives. Mm -hmm. I think I it mean, makes perfect sense. I'm willing to bet that you write a program, you do, do L1 regularization of L0 using as basis your dynamic primitives, you'll get the right, uh, the right explanation. So. I mean, it's, I think it's worth trying. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, and we're in fact in the same department, so <laughs> we should talk, right? <laughs> um, so I w was wondering for your tasks, um, if basically you check what happens if you change the parameters of your tasks. But um, if you do this now for multiple values, um, is there any learning aspect that is basically carried over? So um, in how far is what is learned local in this parameter space and what I mean is it probably not local or is there a gradient how it generalizes? Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't done it and I think your, your question is most immediately relevant for the Skittles task where I showed you the different manifolds, the surprisingly different manifolds if you just place that Skittle five centimeters to the left, right? Left, not right. Um, so um, 
it's it's an absolutely obvious question to ask, and I put it to remind me to actually do it. We haven't done it. We have done one. Um, yeah, it's, it doesn't really rate, but I just say we have done one experiment where we uh, inoc uh, where we move the target unnoticeably for the subject, and we looked how long does it take. Uh, so we, we moved it slightly, and you don't see it in that black environment. And then we looked how long does it take until they actually um, move or change their execution variables, and it's up to 20 trials. And then we sort of dragged them through a, a series of displacement, and it was always like 20 trials behind. But uh, I didn't look or didn't address the, the obvious question. Is there potentially some acceleration of how in their following the target when the solution manifold changes in one way versus another one, right? There is an interesting way when the target is exactly um, behind the pole in this top-down view, then the U-shape actually collapses to a vertical um, manifold where the solutions are insensitive to velocity. And so it would be interesting to then ask if we induce these via gradual changes, how long does it take the subjects to find out that they don't have to care about velocity anymore? It's just a single angle and nothing else. So there's ma there, is, there is many, many different and interesting questions to ask based on that very simple system that we know so well. And we can even visually analyze. Um, yes. Um, so, in fact, it's related to the uh, remark, uh, um, the connection with uh, sparsity and chaos. Um, am I missing something, or does that also relate to yesterday's talk on entropy minimization when you want to learn your, your internal model with respect to the external model? So does that all fit in somehow trying to say the same thing, that your internal model fits your... Yes. But I think you're referring to Dr. Friston's talk. Yes. I, I sort of just threw the gauntlet into to what degree um, this idea of predictability meshes with your notion of minimizing surprise. But you, you, you can answer that best. Yeah. The last question, now the last answer. But you should have the last word, because we promised you that last night. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it's a lovely example. I, yes, you're absolutely right, that the, the notion of predictability is exactly consistent, formerly with uh, something called Bayesian surprise, which, which is an invention of people called Itty and Boldy in the context of um, active vision and saliency, uh, sort of computing maps of, of, of um, where to look, um, which has some pragmatic applications. Formally, it's the um, KL divergence between the posterior and the prior, which, of course, mathematically is identical to the mutual information between the outcomes and the con sensory consequences. Um, another lovely point of contact, I thought, was that the, the first experiment where you have the learning of the control variables coming to approximate in their distribution the implicit... Um, prior beliefs about where they should be given the, given, given the, um, the actual error scores mm -hmm. means that the subjects are implicitly also minimizing a Bayesian surprise or KL divergence between their, <laughs> their, actual, their, their, their actual performance uh, and mm -hmm. their pri prior beliefs. So I, I think it's exactly consistent with, mm. with, with, with these information theoretic sort of Bayesian mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. formations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so the same. Thanks again for this speaker.